All right, give me one second here, and we'll get started. All right, good evening everybody. Welcome to episode 44 of my Jump Game Review Series. I am your host, Chris Gogolin. Thank you very much for joining in this evening. Um, we're going to start off tonight's show recapping something I mentioned I went over last week. Uh, our good friend, Brandon Beatty, Killer Kiwi, the guy making the Star Wars documentary, uh, noted that while uh, I was showcasing the foils and stuff last week, uh, it's kind of hard to see the little camera when it's just my little face, so I should try making it bigger. It makes my head bigger temporarily, but then we could actually see some of the foils uh, better, so you guys might actually be able to see what they kind of look like. And that was an excellent suggestion. Thank you very much for that, Brandon. Always trying to learn how to improve. So this is the Jakku Dark Side system foil. This is the one that will be given out uh, for the February OCS uh players who completed at least eight games. If you played 12 games, you'll get two copies of that foil. Um, if you pre-registered by uh, March 1st, you are guaranteed to get, uh, for the MPC that is, the Kylo Ren with lightsaber alternate image uh, foil here. A little hard with the glare. Um, I do have some extras of these depending on how many people sign up and how many signed up after the deadline. Uh, I will start handing them out in order of registration, but uh, people will be given those foils uh, for the match play championships. Registration closes for that this Sunday. We'll cover that more in a little second. Uh, there is also one other foil that I did not showcase last week. Uh, this is the 2019 event winner foil, and it is an AI of Dr. Afra. So a much more uh, interesting picture of her on the this foil as well. Uh, Afra is certainly a character that does see play in a number of decks, so we can uh, expect to see some good things from her. And uh, I did mention that the 2019 League kits had been mailed out. Uh, the uh, Several of the foils that were included in there, I mean, there's an AI of Ray with lightsaber that goes with the Kylo. Um, there's a Vigo slip i remember what else is in there right now. Let me see if I have my list still handy here. Uh, Blue Squadron 1, You Know What I've Come For, and the Jakku Starship Graveyard, or Spaceship Graveyard. Um, if you have perfect attendance and you attend all of your League events, then Director Krennic, eh, more glare, uh, Director Krennic will be the foil that you receive for perfect attendance. And if you happen to win one of your League events, like I managed to do yesterday, uh, then General Leia Organa, you get a full uh, foil V-slip of General Leia. Foil paper is kind of hard between the glare on my computer and whatnot and uh, coming off the monitor. Um, kind of hard to see, but you guys get the point. Yes, the Ray is not an AI in the League kit. She is just the standard Ray, but it is a foil version of Ray with lightsaber. But you are right, Chris Kelly. Thank you for pointing that out. It is not an AI. Now I will shrink my head back to its normally marginally overinflated size. So welcome to the show. Let's take a quick peek at what's going on in the Jemp lobby. All right, so there is an OCS game. We'll pop into that in just a second. Do a quick recap of the standings here where we're at. Uh, Ryan Serson's in the clubhouse as the leader currently with an 11 and 1. That looks like that uh, could hold up for at least one of the spots. He's got a good 44% approximately win rate. Uh, all these other guys at 10 and 2 are kind of waiting to see what happens here with Silver Glenn, who's currently 10 and 0. Uh, he would have to lose both of his last two games. Um, I tried, guys. Uh, you know, got a terrible matchup against him the other day. Uh, I tried to help some of you out, but uh, it did not go uh, as planned. And uh, Silver Glenn played exceptionally well uh, in that game to, to top it off. So uh, he certainly is a. Very skilled, very capable player, and uh, ah, thank you for resubscribing. 
Queso. Uh, that's another thing, guys. Thank you, Queso, for the reminder. Of course, be sure to renew your subscriptions each month, hitting that little magic subscribe button up there. You want to keep your Twitch subscriptions active, so that when we do start mailing out all the prizes for that stuff, you uh, you get the best prizes. And there's a whole thing on the forums about that. Uh, if you are unsure how to do the whole Twitch subscription thing, if you have an Amazon Prime account, you get one free subscription each month. You just have to link your Amazon Prime account to your Twitch account. Uh, then each month you have to manually set it to renew. Uh, the other option is you can just set a paid subscription, which is $4.99 a month. Um, that will automatically renew, I believe, to your credit card or whatever your p preferred billing source is. Um, and then you can get that going. Six months, congratulations, Queso, and thank you very much for the uh, s continued support. I know a lot of you guys are in that five to six month range. I'm sure you'll be renewing your six month subscription soon. But anyway, as I was saying, uh, Silver Glen sitting right there, 10 and 0, likely to get one of the two spots. Uh, all these guys are all finished. Uh, Charlie's down here at 8 and 0. Uh, he also is going to have to win a few more games to make a run. Uh, he's got you know 38%. Silver Glen's kind of the same right now, about 39%. So depending on who left. You know, there aren't a lot of people at the top of the leaderboard left for them to play unless they play each other. Um, you know, the guys that they're going to be playing probably to get those last game or two in uh, could be down here in this pile, about 20 points, uh, which isn't bad. Uh, but if you end up playing against somebody who's kind of over here, like, you know, one of these players who's got, you know, eight, nine or ten games in but only has, like, Unfortunately, I'm going to pick on Martin. Uh, if one of them were to play Martin, obviously that would not help their strength of schedule at this point as he's got eight games in and only 12 points. That would actually probably uh, you know, either fit right into their current strength of schedule or possibly lower it slightly further. Um, playing each other would certainly help whichever one of them wins. Um, but uh, you know, some other guys here, Adam Tronzo, 6-2, uh, could make a little run. Fox here, 6-1, and one, still has some time left. Uh, so only f I will get the April League set up uh, probably tomorrow. I have some housekeeping stuff to do tomorrow, so I'll probably get the April League set up for that, get the registration going, uh, and get some orders shipped out for the Players Committee store, which you can still buy cards from. I do have to do some inventory and some restocking. Uh, there are a number of items that are showing as out of stock that we do have. I just haven't had the time to put it all back up in the store. Worf's 9 and 1. Yeah, Worf's... Uh, Worfs is up there, 9-1. and one. I missed him earlier. Uh, I saw 28 and just kept right on going. He, I thought he was in here with all these other 12s, but no, he does still have two games left to play. So Worfs certainly could make a, a run for it. Um, thank you for pointing that out as well. But uh, the more important thing here is the number of people who hit the eight-game mark. All these people are guaranteed to get at least one copy of the March foil. That's, what, 43 players have played at least eight games on this side of the board plus another dozen or so over here. And uh, plenty of these guys are certainly within striking distance of getting, you know, either through their eighth game for a few of these guys uh, or to 12 to get the second copy of the foil. And uh, I expect to be getting a shipment from uh, Kevin Jap uh, just in time before the MPC. So for all of you guys attending the Match Play Championship in New Brunswick, New Jersey, the weekend of April 26th, you will get your February and March OCS foils in person, um, along with anything else MAOU from last year. Um, I know Wayne had messaged me about some uh, some foils. Yes, Wayne, I keep waiting for you to come to our league events, um, and then I can just hand them to you in person. But I do understand it is a little bit of a commute out from Long Island. Take the train. But uh, that's kind of where we're at with all of those things. The Match Play Championship six days left to sign up and register. Uh, here's all the information on the forums. Registration, match play. We have 37 players signed up. There's a handful of guys who've said they're coming who just haven't pulled the trigger and paid their sign-up fee yet. Um, it'd be great if we could get to 48 because then we don't have to, you know, the first round isn't just all buys with a couple of play-in games. Um, I don't know if we're going to get that far. It'd be great if we can, if you guys uh, know 11 other people who want to sign up and come play. Um, that would be fabulous. I hear there's like a handful of Minnesota guys. Uh, there's no Reed Smith on here yet, who's been at every MPC ever. So for him to miss his first one would be unusual. Um, 
But yeah, I mean, we've got 37 people. Take a quick look at the list. If you're coming to the event and you don't see your friends have signed up yet, uh, you've got five days to uh, really get on their case and or sign up for them and pay their entry fee and then have them pay you back. Uh, that also works too. But uh, we need to get everybody signed up and registered so that way we can start doing the brackets. It's March Madness time. I'm sure everybody's already got there, had filled out their, uh, you know, college basketball brackets. Uh, and now we'd like to get our MPC brackets filled out so we can get those going. The other big event going on right now, of course, is the Gem PC, which is the online version of the Match Play Championship. We are just about done with the uh, the first round just about is over. Uh, the second round, there's still a number of people still left to play their games and get their scores reported. Uh, a couple people who have already advanced, uh, Angelo uh, advanced to play Tom Damon. Silver Glenn's waiting on the winner of this European game for his opponent. Uh, Jared Napolitano pulled an upset over Nick Reich. He'll await the winner of this barnes Pistone game. Uh, I'm waiting for Brian, Fred, and Charlie to play their games. Some schlub named Chris Kelly still has to find time to play John Michael. A Rebel Spy advances. He's going to wait the winner of Worfs and Batmouse. That should be an interesting game. Uh, and uh, Ryan Jellison uh, advanced uh, into the second round uh, with games against Dan Tartaglione. Dan streamed both of his games um, the other night on Twitch. I don't know if they're still available. I know when Dan streamed his first round matchup, he didn't set his Twitch up to like record and save games for two weeks, which is what it's not a default feature in Twitch. Something you have to manually turn on to have it remember to do. Um, and I don't know that Dan had done that yet. Um, just find out if his games against Ryan are available to watch. Uh, we will feature Ryan and Echo Base here in our featured game of the week. This was from their Gem PC match uh, from round one. Uh, they split games in round one. Uh, they were both pretty close. Uh, games, and I won't tell you which one we're going to review, uh, whether it's the one that Ryan won or the one that uh, I'm drawing a blank on uh, this particular player's name right now. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to figure that out and come back to you. But uh, before I go on to you know checking out games and things like that, I uh, do have another little bit of sad news to pass along from the community. I did not catch this earlier. Uh, one of the local Massachusetts players, Sam DeWall, uh, passed away after a long battle with a, an illness. Um, he passed away in mid-February, and uh, the Massachusetts guys did uh, honor him at their local event that took place uh, just this past weekend. Um, they did a small little collection and uh, made a donation to his high school music department, which I guess he was a teacher at or involved with. And uh, David Dredge set up the collecting of the donations, and the, all the entry fees from the league event were donated to that, as well as some other donations from the players in attendance. Um, they had six players. I think they raised a little over $100 that they donated. Uh, but it's just something nice to see that, you know, this is the type of community that we have where when things like this happen, um, you know, we all sort of band together um, and want to pay our respects and, you know, do something nice. I believe David also made some uh, foil cards, if I've ever seen them somewhere in here. Um, just like some memorial foils and things like that that he handed out to um, the family of, uh, of Sam and, uh, you know, just uh, sort of passed along to his, their family our condolences and just, you know, um, the fact that his presence will be missed in the, uh, in the Massachusetts League um, he had played in the first couple of league events and uh, unfortunately uh, passed away just a few weeks ago. Um, I'm going to follow up with these guys and see if they plan on doing anything further as a uh, fundraiser or anything like that. And if so, I'll be sure to highlight that and uh, give it a little more attention so we can try and get a little bit more of a donation raised. I'll be reaching out to uh, both Grady and David uh, this week to to uh, coordinate that and just find out if they have any plans for anything else. But I did want to obviously highlight their efforts and uh, showcase just, you know, some of the good things that the community does do beyond just uh, the game itself and uh, that we are a community of players and of people. And, uh, you know, unfortunately, uh, you know, sorry, best wishes to Sam's family and, and all that. So, All right. 
We went through the gem PC, we went through the bracket. Let's quick, quick pop back over to Jemp. There, oh, looks like that game's over already. All right, I don't think I was talking that long, but uh, there was a, an OCS game going on here, but that game seems to have wrapped up already, so uh, we'll keep an eye on uh, the lobby here. But in the meantime, we will pop over to our featured match. Go big screen for this. Uh, this is between Ryan Jellison and... All right, I got to figure this out because this is embarrassing. <laughs> All right, I will work on that. In the meantime, let's go ahead and get this game rolling. It's Echo Base Trooper on the forums, but I'm, I apologize. I'm drawing a complete blank on the particular player's name at this moment. So it's Sack and Echo are what we're going with today. So we're not using real names for either player. Uh, it's going to be EBO against Coruscant CRV. Certainly should be some interesting space battles in this game. So for those of you unfamiliar with either deck, uh, Coruscant CRV, you start the 2-0 Coruscant system. Uh, you use the combat response, which lets you download a related site. It has to be a battleground if the system was not a battleground. You start the, the Prince's Palace, which lets you pull the other palace sites. Uh, some decks run one, some decks run two. Um, it does get hard to try and balance covering three sites. So usually you'll see him play just two sites, uh, not all three. And then they usually start Kuat Drive Yards to pull other systems. Uh, Endor Shield is an interesting one. Um, I would think he's going to do Kuat for Star Destroyers and Endor Shield for Admirals in this case. Um, some of the other variants will use Combat Response and they'll play matching Starfighters. Uh, and then you'll see things like Fat and Slave 1 and Baron with uh, maybe a cannon or a Jendin with a cannon, that kind of stuff. Um, and then Security Precautions is usually the third effect, which uh, helps with the uh, activation, giving you plus one force generation there. On the rare chance you play Hidden Base, it's got this extra bonus text where you could make them uh, lose some extra cards, but that rarely comes into play as Hidden Base is not the most popular deck these days. On the flip side, we've got Hoth, CRV, EBO. We've kind of covered this one in previous matchups. Uh, this one may be a slightly different variant. As we see, he's starting maneuvering flaps. Uh, instead of like Wackling or something like that to pull Haven, he's going with the flaps for the matching speeders. Um, and we'll probably see him pull Echo Base Garrison as one of his Echo cards. That's the one that lets you take some of the guys like uh, Commander Luke and uh, Zev and Hobby into hand, which you can then easily match up for their speeders as well. Adam. Yes, Adam does sound familiar. Doors conceded after you beat him down a couple times. Well, good job, Sean, on beating him down. And uh, way to pop over into the show and uh, just in time to, uh, you know, smack him down and then get to business and get over here where you, uh, you know, where you need it to be. All right. So Ryan's going to grab Ozzel and Thrawn. He's going to play Death Squadron Assignment, which is another new virtual card uh, that we've seen a little bit of. Uploads a card with Death Squadron in lore. There are like five cards you can currently get with this right now. Um, Stalker, Tyrant. Um, there's a one or two characters, pilots. You can, I think Ozzel's actually one of the characters you can get um, with that because he's got... Yeah, he's got Death Squadron. Um, there's like five or six different cards you can pull with Death Squadron, so it does have some uses. It's a nice used four. Um, and then you always have the ability with the Lost version sometimes, depending on the deck. Uh, you usually see this more in like Hoth, uh, Hoth Walkers, like a Dark Side CRV playing off Hoth instead, because um, then they get the bonus text of downloading to an, an Imperial to a Hoth location. However, when you're playing against EBO, they give you Hoth locations, so it kind of works out nicely there as well. And Ryan will pull the second palace site, the third one being the sewer, which is the underground site. If he's playing matching Star Destroyers and stuff, he may not want the underground site because then he can't shuttle guys up and down. It does make it a little harder. He's got 
Fondor and Nalhutta. Could possibly see Chirinu in here as well. Um, trying to keep stuff within a certain number of parsecs, but looks like he's going more for the drain minus one system route. Both Nalhutta and Fondor have drain minus one text. So. We're going to see. Echo's going to pull his two locations, which is what a new secret base gets you. Uh, one string each of your turns, take up to two sites, or one site and one effect, with Echo and Title, or a planet system with two light side icons into hand from reserve deck. Usually people will do this before they activate, so you don't risk activating something. Uh, you just have to be a little careful with how much stuff you pull right away, um, so you don't end up getting like Grimtoshed or Monocked. Because uh, you pull two generals with strike planning, and then you pull two locations, and that gets you to exactly 12 cards. So if you had anything else, like if you pull like the shield and then don't do that again to go get an immediate effect or something, you'd be at 13, and then you run the risk of them slapping you with Monarch, and then you've just wasted all your once-per-game pulls and uh, completely screwed yourself. So just be careful when you're pulling stuff uh, very early that you keep your hand size at 12, even if it's only for a moment. If you're planning on deploying everything, uh, you, if you get to 13, you could end up, you know, screwing yourself over pretty poorly. Thank you very much, Sater. Adam Fletcher, that is it. Ah, I had a feeling it started with an F. Uh, so thanks to Adam for providing the game links for this. We were watching from Adam's point of view. And he's got his two locations out. If he's going to go with... Riken for two to the war room. Uh, he's got Radis. He's got Dodonna. If he had the third site and the EBO already, he could first turn flip. Uh, and Or not flip, there's no objective. But he could be completely set up on turn one. Um, Radis deploying for free is obviously a huge advantage, and he's kind of the guy you tend to want a leadership for first because of that. But uh, oh, there's the EBO right there in his force pile, so he's going to draw that up. Um, so this will allow him next turn then to get an even slightly uh, faster start by getting one of the cards in hand. Now he can pull the third site and the Echo Base Garrison as opposed to having to pull Echo Base Operations and then get Garrison the following turn. Oh, Ryan is playing all three sites. Okay. Um, plenty of activation for him here. He's already at 16 between the three sites uh, and the, the two extra systems. And he's going to opt for Mara Jade with Lightsaber. And he's going to make an aggressive push because I believe to deploy EBO... Nope, you just have to occupy three Echo sites. But uh, the opponent can cancel it if they occupy five Hoth sites. So he can start walking in here, and that could cause some problems, especially without the docking bay and the war room being here. I probably would have preferred the corridor to be here so she couldn't mar people couldn't march right into the war room. Um, it's a site location layout thing. I always prefer to stick the war room all the way at the end. Um, just because that's where you want your guys to end up, and you kind of want them to be as far away from danger as possible um, because of the text on the war room, which gives you bonus power at Hoth locations. So in this particular case, very smartly by Ryan, deploys Blizzard 4, gets the guy, walks the Blizzard Walker in, the guy gets off, now Mara can move over into the war room. Uh, not only is he covering two sites, but now he's got Mara sitting in front of Riken who doesn't do anything by himself and is now going to be pressured and might actually have to abandon the war room, which, losing his power bonus for the rest of the game, or he's going to have to commit several other characters to, uh, to try and clear this out. Your movement to or from here requires plus one force. That's the other text on this site. So it cost him two to move the walker over, and then it cost him two to move Mara. So be sure and take careful uh, attention to that extra cost as well. Yes, I believe he is from Utah. So now he'll get the docking bay, and now he'll get the Echo Base Garrison. See... By having his sights laid out like this, as we just mentioned, now his choice is to retreat Riken to the hallway, which doesn't really do anything for him. Um, as opposed to, if the site was here, then this guy would be in, Mara would be in front of Dodonna, 
and then Dodonna can retreat to the War Room, where he then gets the power bonus and whatnot, um, and he could deploy guys and battle and, you know, possibly that there. Now he's looking at, I mean, it's, it's inconvenient, so just a preference there. I would prefer to lay the sights out a little differently. He's still going to set up EBO this turn, and, uh, you know, it, depending on what he's looking at here, he uh, he could rain some holy hell on, you know, Blizzard 4 and whatnot. He's going to get the docking bay out. He's going to get the EBO set up. He's going to have the echo base garrison. He's already got Rogue One in hand, so if Commander Luke is still in here, he can drop a Commander Luke that's immune to less than six on Blizzard 4 and, uh, you know, battle and draw two Destiny and clear that thing out of there. Um, possibly even throwing Wedge in there with it to cancel his battle Destiny uh, and cause some overflow or... Uh, you know, Poe as a secondary pilot to get an additional battle dust. Well, Luke draws two if unable to otherwise anyway, but... Um, or, you know, Wedge and Poe could also get two battle destiny uh, and cancel his and, you know, still have pretty solid power and whatnot, possibly cause some overflow here, so... And with three cards saved and 15 in hand, you expect Ryan to have a barrier, but you still got to make him play it. Yep, so there's the free Radis. And now we'll get that EBO set up. And now we're going to go see who we can get with Echo Base Garrison, who might still be floating around in there. Hey, there's a Commander Luke. So he's got Commander Wedge and Wedge Red Squadron Leader. I don't know about that one, personally. I mean, I guess... They both have their uses. Uh, usually you pick one or the other, whether you wanted to cancel Destiny or whether you wanted Wedge, who uh, adds one to your Force Drains, I believe, is what the Commander Wedge does. So he's going to Flaps, revealing Commander Luke, and pulling the other copy of Rogue One out of his deck, getting a lower Destiny out of there. Okay. And there's the Barrier that he draws out from his opponent, which will get grabbed. Not a bad grab, especially if you plan on, uh, you know, being offensive with your battles, as EBO sometimes likes to do. All right, looks like he is going to go for uh, trying to clear out his war room here. With uh, Riken and Hera. One of them's going to get hit, the other one's going to get cleared from Battle Destiny. Unless Ryan happens to draw a zero somehow. Um, worst case scenario would be if he had a sniper, and then he just hits Hera, and then snipers are out of the battle or something. But it's not a card you commonly see play in dark side decks as often as you see light side playing. Sorry about the mess. So. Not as big of a cause for concern to worry about that card. We'll see the two Battle Destiny for light side here. It should just all be uh, academic at this point. Yeah. Probably uh, very unlikely that they would draw high enough to clear Mara, uh, to cause overflow to Mara. You know, she four pits for seven, she's power five. Close, but not quite there. Well, Riken's a good guy that you, I mean, you want to keep around. His main goal, obviously, is to flip, but uh, being a leader, adding to the war room, the movement text, moving people for free, Rebels and T-47s at same and related locations, move for free. So having your T-47s chase people around and having your Rebels shuttle up to your ship and move between your sites and stuff like that for free um, is certainly a, uh, a card advantage. But losing him is not the end of the world. It's not like him being at the War Room gives you such a huge benefit and bonus that you need to make sure that it happens, but... Uh, be very shocked if we uh, 
see this Blizzard 4 stick around here and do much of anything. Oh, looks like he's got the castle. I'm guessing he's going to pull the Mustafar as well. So I'm going to pause for a second here. I'm looking at Ryan's deck, and I know he's got a lot of expensive cards in it, but I think there might be a little bit of overkill in the old uh, <laughs> location package. So Ryan's an excellent deck builder. Certainly not going to fault him for that. Um, but, I mean, he's got three battleground systems and three battleground sites in his deck. It's very unlikely he's going to be able to cover all of those locations and certainly doesn't need 2, 4, 6, 8, 10, 12, 14, 16. One for him is 17, plus security precautions is 18. He's giving himself 18 force, <clears throat> which is also a little bit excessive. Um, if he is running Mustafar with Vader's Castle and these two other battleground systems, I'd like to see him drop one of these three sites, um, take one of these sites away, um, and possibly even one of these systems. I know, obviously, he wants to keep, because the Star Destroyers can only move three parsecs at a time, uh, with Coruscant at zero, if, like, Tantive or something shows up here, he doesn't have a way to move stuff around to chase it. Um, without having his systems laid out like such. So if you're going to keep these three systems, I'd like to see him drop a site. That's just a personal preference. So if you're copying Ryan's deck list and you, uh, you know, are looking for something fun to play, try it with two sites, not three. Because with this extra site over here, um, you, don't, you don't need this extra force, and it's just an extra liability um, and one extra card slot that could be something more useful. What do you guys think? Too many force? Too much force? Too many locations? Yes? No? Everybody fell asleep? All right, we'll check back later. Oh. oh, other interesting thing, as long as we're talking about weird reactions and interactions, the Hoth Energy Shield rules are in effect. So this Blizzard 4 here is under the shield. Light side can deploy all the stuff they want. Dark side can't. Uh, this is, goes back to the old Decipher rules with the Hoth Energy Shield. They have to deploy guys outside the shield at the fourth marker and walk their way in. So this Blizzard 4 here can't get any backup without deploying and then walking over. Like Maul may do here, Blizzard 4 could also move back out, which is probably the more likely scenario. Um, but, I mean, it could obviously, he could start walking guys in to try to, you know, cover enough locations. I don't know that that necessarily would happen. But we could see Maul move in, get on the walker, the walker move to the docking bay, and Maul get back off. Um, and then he's, you know, got guys at the interior sites, and he can start trying to move Maul through to try to, uh, you know, get to the five locations he's going to need to if he wants to cancel EBO. Um, he could just also move Blizzard 4 back out, and then just kind of hold this battleground site where he stops his opponent from occupying a satisfying battle plan and kind of piling guys up here makes this little Luke not quite as scary. Uh, but Luke's obviously going to get some backup, usually in the form of Wedge. Um, and then you're talking about Destiny canceling and all that stuff. But the more cards he commits to the ground, the fewer cards he has to commit to space. And since we've seen nobody commit anything to space yet, uh, this certainly should be... It's where you think the most of the game would play out, would be in space. But uh, so far, the early turns have been all ground-based. Yeah, speaking of Adam, there he is. Adam, if you go back and watch the beginning of the stream, I apologize. I was totally blanking on your name. I apologize. All right, so he's going to move Maul over. We'll see if Maul gets in. Yep. And then he's going to move to the docking bay. Yeah. So that'll certainly continue to put pressure. Oh, he's going to trample Radis. Trying to take out more characters to keep more guys off ships, get rid of some of his pilots and things like that. And Radis does not get to use his once per game pull to get the Lightmaker, which we saw him draw for Destiny earlier. Um, he would have had a small little window there uh, to pull it, and obviously you could have done that at any point during the turn, but especially once the walker moved over, uh, it might not have been a bad idea to pull the ship out of the deck. 
Dodana's going to grab Gold Leader. He could also get something with uh, Echo Base Garrison. That is, once during each of your turns, you're allowed to pull a card with Echo Base Garrison. Uh, there might be some people out there who think that this is once during each turn, but it's each of your turns. Um, and you can get uh, Special Edition Wedge, Hoth, Luke, Zev, Hobby, Bakta Tank, or Lone Rogue. Lone Rogue rarely played Bakta Tank. Bakta Tank's rarely played. Lone Rogue is almost never played. Um, but really, this is just played to get, you know, Luke, Wedge, and possibly Zev or Hobby, depending on how many speeders you're playing. Um, and this type of deck, since you only have the one site, you don't need all four combos, because it's probably just Luke and Wedge and maybe one of the other two combos. Uh, I would probably go with Hobby in that case, because you could run EPP Hobby and Rogue 4, who at least uh, has some ability as a pilot or as a uh, uh, an EPP character that you could utilitarily use somewhere else. Nobody there to match for, though. No extra speeders either. Alright, but Rogue 3 was there. So we can see Wedge and Rogue 3 can go to the Hoth docking bay here. And we'll see if he's got another barrier. It would cost him all three force to do it. Right now, Wedge by himself isn't the scariest. Make him commit the second pilot before you play the barrier. In this, this case, the second pilot being Poe. If you had a barrier, now would have been that would have been the time to play it. Uh, he does not, however, have said barrier. So now you're looking at nine power, two battle destiny because Poe adds one. Echo base garrison makes this. I mean, Wedge makes it immune to less than three because that's the text of the vehicle. Poe makes it immune to less than five. Garrison makes it immune to less than six because the matching pilot is aboard, being Wedge, because he's the one referenced in the game text of the ship, or vice versa. So in this case, you've got nine power, two battle destiny, canceling their destiny, and completely immune, uh, or immune to less than six attrition, which, again, doesn't come into play because you're canceling their destiny draw anyway. He's going to get an extra power here from the war room as well, putting him up to ten. And for each ship he's got at the Hoth system, that will also add one power to his total. And we're going to see him put a couple of ships up in space. Curiously enough, he puts together two ships that don't draw Battle Destiny. We'll cover that in a second. So Gold Leader and Gold 1 is only two ability. The Corellian Corvette here is only one ability, so that only would be three. I assume he's thinking he's going to draw high enough to clear both things out of here, where then, like, Poe could get off the ship and then shuttle up to the Corvette. But he is certainly running the risk that, uh, you know, there's no haven here or anything. He's not adding a Battle Destiny. Uh, and They don't have enough ability by themselves to draw. Um, you know, EBO trying to, to, to get eight with two draws isn't uh, the most likely scenario could happen it certainly could happen and he gets nine so it just proves me wrong altogether right there so that will clear both guys which then leaves him free to uh, move one and or both oh he declines not to cancel it, not sure why. Um, that then allowed Ryan the opportunity to play Sith Fury to take Maul into hand, giving himself an extra character in hand. And now he'll redraw it. I'm sure he just thought, it's a one, who cares? I'm immune to it anyway. But that's the reason why you just cancel it anyway, because you can. It's one less power that he has. Um, and it stops him from having the ability to do something like Sith Fury. So that's another good teaching moment out there. You have the opportunity to cancel it, even though you, you may not think it's relevant, just cancel it. <laughs> it's 
it's not like you can do anything with that later. So then I'll go ahead and shuttle Poe up like we uh, had theorized. But if he had drawn a little lower, that might have been a little more difficult. I suppose he could have moved Luke back. Um, you know, move Poe out, you know, get Poe out, shuttle him up, and then move Luke over with Wedge. If uh, if he had only drawn like six or seven and just gotten rid of Maul, and Blizzard 4 would still there. And now finally, turn four. Now we're going to see the space action we've all been waiting for. As the Stalker, thematically, piloted by Ozel, uh, arrives at the Hoth system to find the Rebels and their hidden base. And quite a pile of stuff do we have. So, we've got the Stalker. We've got Veers, Marek Steele, who opponent may not cancel or substitute. This is only while he's piloting a Starfighter, so he doesn't draw if unable to otherwise. Thrawn adds one while piloting a uh, Star Destroyer. So he's getting two Battle Destiny here, 19 power. He'll have to pay one for each of those Battle Destiny draws because of Gold Leader. Um... And then he plays the lateral damage to make the Corvette power zero, taking eight power away from light side. Now we see in Adam's hand, he's got the card that cancels lateral damage, but he's going to play a little uh, wait, a little wait see with this one. He could just cancel it right out right now, but that's going to let his opponent know, okay, I've got a canceler for this. Right now his opponent's feeling pretty good. It's 19 to four. He's getting two battle destiny. His opponent's getting two, but he's got plenty of guys on here, especially Veers and whatnot, that he doesn't need that he can easily throw away. He may have an Imperial Command that can limit him to one, and he's feeling really good about, uh, you know, just clearing this whole thing out all in one fell swoop. Ryan's going to initiate this battle. Do this as a weapons phase action, which is exactly what it looks like Adam is uh, holding back on and is going to do. Uh, do it during the weapons phase once the battle's committed. Cancel the lateral damage. Get yourself the eight power back. And, uh, you know, that sort of changes just how effective that battle is going to be. If you cancel it beforehand, there's the possibility that Ryan doesn't battle and instead might deploy an additional pilot, thinking he's going to need a little bit more forfeit or he might have to stay around another turn or two. Um, so you're kind of luring him in a little bit, lulling him into that false sense of security that everything's going to go great for you, Ryan, and then you're going to cancel his lateral damage mid-battle, and uh, then come back over the top with some of these other ships the following turn. Oh, and we see a first strike as well. Okay. He does have a force left available, so he can still play the interrupt during the... Uh, excuse me, during the uh, weapons phase action, because first strike here, in addition to doing the retrieve one, lose one, when you initiate a battle text... Um, Light side has to spend a force each interrupt they play in battles that the dark side initiates. Uh, but he does still have the force available, and there's nothing else in his hand that he would rather use that force on. He's already grabbed a card, so he can certainly go ahead and spend that force uh, for the interrupt and still doesn't need to, uh, to jump and play this early. He should pull the aim high shield, though, to make dark side spend one of their force to retrieve this Blizzard 4. That's going to cut him down to 4, they have to spend one to initiate the battle. It leaves them with three. They have to spend two force to draw each of their battle destiny draws. That only leaves them with one, which means they either have to... They don't get to draw any cards. Um, they'd have to pay one to move away, which would leave them with none. And then you could still possibly deploy other ships and battle them. Um, or they're going to stay here with just that one force and, uh, and not really have anything that they can do because the barrier is already grabbed. All right, Adam will go ahead and cancel that a little early. Um, again, like I said, you could have waited until the weapons segment action because it's not like he had any other actions that this one force was going to use. So he could have uh, opted to do it during the weapons segment. Ryan does still initiate the battle, though, except 
the other thing. Now, with the first strikeout, the card he retrieved isn't the Blizzard 4. The card he retrieved is the lateral damage, which could come back at some point later in the game and uh, and be problematic. If he had done it during the battle, it would have been after the retrieval, and he wouldn't have gotten the lateral damage back. Just going to go to Battle Destinies. He'll spend the Force. He'll draw his two. Poe forfeits for six. That's not going to quite be enough. It's probably going to be Poe and the Corvette. It could be Poe and Gold Eater. I'd probably lose Poe and the Corvette at this point. He also didn't pull the shield, so the retrieval was free. So he's got two force left now. So Gold Eater is not quite as uh, as scary because he does have that two force left. So this might be a case of losing... Well, what does Tycho do? Yeah, he only works on Starfighters. Yeah, so two minor little misplays there. And we'll see how much that uh, influences the rest of the game. But uh, some good Destiny draws again. Uh, cause him to get rid of Ozzel and Veers. Uh, Ryan has to lose here, so he's down to just two pilots. Uh, keeping Thrawn and, uh, and Marek. Keeping his two Destiny together, but he has the two Force left, as we mentioned. Um, and we'll have to see... Nope, he is going to stick it out and stay. And there is the Bakta tank. Okay. Plenty of force activation, so that's not a bad card to see show up. Certainly costs uh, four to deploy. And then what this card does, for those of you unfamiliar with this Hoth rare, it holds one patient at a time, a non-droid character you just lost, maybe placed here instead of lost pile. During your deploy phase, you can use X-Force to bring him into hand, where X equals his deploy cost. So when you forfeit, say, a pilot off a ship, you can put him in the Bakta tank, as long as nobody else is already there. Then during your deploy phase, you spend whatever his deploy cost is, take him back into your hand, and then probably spend it again and redeploy him. It's good for uh, cheap cost guys that you like to loop around. Radis is great for it because his deploy cost is zero, so he's basically a free four forfeit every turn. Um, some of your other pilots and things could also work out with that. Um, you know, Poe's a little more expensive because his cost is four. Uh, Wedge being only three is a little bit more reasonable. And that certainly could be what we see happen here. Um, possibly seeing Luke move out to the fourth marker, the Tantiv coming down, Corrin Horn coming down uh, as a pilot, and then Wedge shuttling up. Uh, all could be actions that we see here. Um, and even Leia could make an appearance. 4-8, uh, pretty good ratios, deploy forfeit, throwing her as a passenger on you know one of these ships and having her be the guy you forfeit to the Bakta tank you know, could soak up quite a bit of damage. Oh, looks like he's going to move away. <laughs> He's going to spread out. He'll land the ship for now. And he's just going to probably redraw a few cards and uh, reload his hand a little bit. He's going to stack the third marker with Wedge. Okay. I thought maybe he might have had Wedge get out and like get in Gold Leader and then possibly take back off next turn with some of these other ships. But nope. He's just going to lock down this fourth marker as this is my battleground site. You're not taking it from me this game. <laughs> Don't even try. Um, you know, he's got 13 power, two battle destiny. He's canceling destiny. He's immune to six um, each ship. So. It's going to be very, di very difficult to uh, to get around that. And 
Now we've got the tent of over here, which adds an icon. But we do also see some other ships that we don't normally see. I do want to take a quick peek. The Phantom is not one we get to see very often. Uh, you know, uh, it is a virtual set 8 from the Rebel series. May deploy with a pilot or move as a react to same system as a Rebel starship. Comes in handy, um, especially because EBO makes everything deploy minus one. So this and a pilot could deploy cheap. Um, but it does not uh, have a permanent pilot or anything aboard it. As well, the main one, of course, he picked up was the spiral, which deploys minus three as a react, minus one more from EBO. So it deploys for one as a react. So that certainly gives it uh, some more staying power. But we are going to see Dark Side opt now to go to their own sites, which was inevitable that they would, you know, they messed around early, tried to disrupt him, tried to burn a few key characters and cards and make him commit resources to Hoth. And, uh, and now we're going to see uh, some other stuff. Just go off planet, get your battleground sites, uh, and then just try and you know, spread out and do some drains of your own. Occupy three battlegrounds for resistance, so now these are only drains of two in space uh, instead of three or four. Uh, Death Squadron assignment also pulls the Executor, one of the other five, six cards that it gets. So this is a drain of three. It is a battleground system because the Tantive adds an icon, but resistance caps the force loss at two. So two and one there, and then this will be one, one, and this would be two, but I have a feeling we're going to see some of these ships go into Hoth. We're going to, oh, no, looks like he's just going to concede Hoth and spread out. Okay. He's going to draw some more ships. I'm a little surprised by that, to be honest. He's got five other ships in his hand right now. Um... You know, I would, very, would have been surprised not, I'm sorry, I would not have been surprised to see Masanya go to Hoth, uh, Tycho go to Hoth, Gold Leader take off, and then when he battles you here, deploy the Spiral as a react. Um, and then you've got like, you know, 5, 10, 13... 17, 20, 21 power. Uh, it's pretty pretty sizable power difference over what your opponent has here. I mean, he did reload a few more guys and ships, but you do have a barrier as well. Um, I don't know. I just feel like you're just uh, conceding too big. You're conceding your own system to them when you don't necessarily need to. I'm sure he may be trying to find some pilots, though, before he commits to that line. So he can just keep looping guys around in the Bakta tank. But I don't know what other pilots he might have left. Because Luke and Wedge are already on the ground. We can get Wedge out and shuttle Wedge up. Um, and then just keep the speeder around for extra forfeit. But I don't know that there's going to be much that would contest against Luke anyway at this point. So Veers is dead. Veers would be the concern you would have. Uh, he, he's dead. You know, Maul and Dooku are over there. Vader and I have you now, maybe? But then you just throw Luke in the tank and uh, and bring him back with the other Rogue One that's in your hand. Oh, I'll grab Kane and Jarrus. Okay. Yeah, I did just pull the Executor, so I could... Executor could be a concern. Him spending 15... He does obviously get enough force to activate it and deploy it all. But, I mean, you're still in your mid-20s. He's in his mid-20s in terms of total power and whatnot. I don't know. Just a thought. Oh, he's got a force push as well. He's probably going to get the lateral damage. Fortunately for Adam, he redrew the canceller. Uh oh, we're getting a revert. Okay.
occasionally when people do reverts, their game lengths freeze up and uh, no longer work. So luckily this was not the case, and we'll get to see the uh, exciting conclusion of this game. So there's the, the mighty conquest going after the Masanya. There's a second Blizzard 4 hit in the table. Conquest did not get barriered. We will see the spiral as a react here, I'm sure. Uh, minor risk, of course, that uh, the spiral could get barriered in this case. But uh, Tycho also deploys as a react, doesn't he? Yeah. Nope, see, there's the gick to cancel the react. Tycho costs two to deploy as a react. And, uh, and then here comes the spiral. Now, spiral normally costs one in this case, but the game text on Fondor says something about Corellian Corvettes are forfeit minus four and deploy plus one if you occupy. So because he occupies, so this spiral is forfeit minus four. And uh, actually, they're both forfeit minus four. And, uh, and deploy plus one and it would probably I mean there's a slim chance that if he draws a five uh, he'd have to lose both ships so that might have been worth a barrier and here comes that second dark side imperial barrier on the spiral now so Masanya is going to end up getting burned by him having double react cancelers. Not necessarily would have expected that. He expected him to have one way to cancel a react, um, not two. But probably would have played better safe than sorry here and just barrier the conquest when it hit the table. Still not the end of the world though. Masanya will die. Spiral is still there. And then he's got you know, other ship in hand plus Ray. Ray will probably fish him something out of the used pile, which would be very helpful, and probably let him then, you know, redeploy in battle. And no, oh, he's going to move over. Okay, even worse. Well, still get some couple of drains in. Both sides are draining. Dark sides 25, 28 total. Light side uh, is about 25 total. So they're still pretty close and even in uh, in force totals and uh, and board position at this point. Um, you know, these three little drains of one here, obviously light side wants to kick dark side out of space. Um, they're going to mitigate a little bit of damage here with, uh, with projection. Light side could just take a turn off. You know, slap Haven back on Hoth, redeploy a ship here, move Spiral back over, have Gold Leader take off to the system. He doesn't deploy Haven. Interesting. Okay. Uh, Leia is going to initiate a battle, though. That's going to get him some force retrieval. Uh, he gets the one from first strike, plus Leia herself also says if she, if anywhere a resistance character initiates battle, they retrieve a force. Uh, she counts and she counts herself. So this will be a nice uh, short little swing here. He can get two cards back and cause his opponent to lose one. Uh, Blizzard 4 is also not immune to any attrition or anything, which Leia is. So if you were to draw low, lower than four, uh, Leia could possibly stick around. Oh. He draws Profundity for Destiny, which he will redraw with the effective repairs combo. And he'll get a 5 instead.
and Darkseid de declines to draw a battle destiny. All right, just to be clear, kids, if you're watching this at home, um, <laughs> it's a good thing he has that Rebel Barrier right now, otherwise I would not recommend this play because the possibility of Leia sticking around and staying on table uh, is not ideal. Um, Kurt certainly could be a potential, you know, game swinging beatdown, uh, you know, with another EPP or something like that. I mean, Maul's already on the table, but Ellis certainly a possibility to move Maul over. Um, an EPP Vader or something could still come down. Another uh, Mara or Kylo or something as well are all possibilities. Uh, so having the barrier certainly makes this play uh, a little less risky. And what we saw from Ryan here is he declined to draw Battle Destiny, therefore uh, Light Side would have no Force loss, so therefore they can't lose Leia even if they wanted to, is what happened there. So Leia's kind of stuck there. Oh, and we get to see the rarely used text on the new Virtual Spiral. So the Spiral, I'm sorry, on the Stalker, Spiral moves over, and the new bonus text is, if opponent starship just moved from here, Stalker may follow. So now the Stalker gets to move back to Hoth, and now we're going to see possibly that Executor come down. Now he's got choices, though, because he's not going to have enough force to deploy everything um, and still draw Destiny and stuff. If he wants to pay 15 for the Executor, plus 6 for Vader or whoever to put down, or possibly Ellis somebody or whatever, whatever these three cards are in his hand. He won't be able to take advantage of both situations uh, in the same turn here. So I'm a little surprised he didn't put the Haven out. Just to give himself that second battle destiny uh, here in space. Alright, and he will go ahead and play it a little safe, and he will shuttle Leia up to avoid the beatdown. So that's also a, uh, a gr good, good defensive move, good recognizing of the situation there by Adam. Uh, realizing that Leia might uh, have found herself in a uh, precarious predicament and uh, and getting her out of dodge. And now he can save his barrier for the Executor or whatever comes down here to Hoth. Yeah, it's Tarkin. Tarkin will add a battle destiny. And there's that Kylo that we were talking about. And he barriers Kylo. Other than the fact of the one force loss, I'm not sure. I mean, yes, obviously he's representing the possibility with only one card left in hand. We know it's the Executor that he does not have a Gick, so trapping Kylo there certainly uh, seems pretty good. I, I'm not quite sure about this play then from Ryan's side, what he's hoping to accomplish here. He's walking into a buzzsaw, basically. He's got lowly Kylo, who doesn't do anything by him. I mean, he draws a Destiny. He can do a one-force trade with First Strike, but I mean, he's canceling your battle Destiny, and he's drawing two of his own. And it's 12 to 6. Kylo only covers 7. So you're going to be peeling a bunch of cards here. I don't understand this play from Ryan. And what he's trying to accomplish with this. Unless it was really just a way to bait out the Rebel Barrier. but uh, Or possibly cause some Force loss or whatnot. Because I mean, none of these were 6s either. So... Even if Wedge wasn't canceling his destiny, he still doesn't do enough to crack either ship's immunity. So it really is just a ping one, retrieve one scenario. And uh, then he's going to end up peeling more than the one card he just retrieved afterwards. So I don't know where Ryan was going with this move.
had a destiny with Tarkin. He'll end up having to pay for those destinies. He's got to spend three force now to draw all three of them. And unfortunately, they are going to be pretty good. And because of the diminished forfeit value of the spiral, uh, this probably may end up clearing everything. The other possibility would have been uh, deploying the Phantom as like a react. Oh, none of these can hold ships. Never mind, that won't work. I thought the Corvette could hold starships, but it can't, so never mind. He doesn't have enough force for the ship plus the pilot. It would cost four total, and he only has three. If he had put Haven out, he would have had enough to deploy Ray Phantom as a react uh, to Hoth. So on top of getting a second battle destiny there, he also would have had more power, and then Ray adding one to the total and whatnot. So um, not 100% sure why Haven didn't come out last turn. But but now with 13 attrition, uh, that's going to get all three ships and actually clear everything. I know you're thinking, if you're thinking like, oh, well, that's why you didn't do it, because Haven would have just been canceled. But Haven wouldn't have been canceled because you would have had more power there and, uh, you know, Ray and another ship. So Ray would have covered seven to the Bakta tank, who's an ideal character to go to the Bakta tank, because each time you deploy her, you get to take a card. Um, so she would have covered seven, the Phantom would have covered four, and then you lose Tycho, and then you still get to keep the Spiral and Gold Leader here. And then you just pull Ray back out of the tank, deploy Ray in the Profundity, and do that whole thing. And instead we get him shuttling some guys down now, and leaving the Stalker by itself. Uh, still not a great shape for these guys. They will get two Battle Destiny, but Wedge is going to cancel one of them. He's going to cancel whichever one of them is in a six. There's Profundity. Now we see Haven. And now we'll see Ray join as well. And see what cards she finds. Hey, perfect, another ship. Oh, Ice Storm. <laughs> That's also an interesting one. Can just play the Ice Storm here and make all these guys go missing. Um, could have taken the X-Wing as well. The X-Wing being capable of deploying to Haven, to Hoth for free. Uh, that would allow him to battle in both places, causing force loss and retrieval from first strike. Uh, and Ray would then also battle with Leia. So that would give you some additional options. But he opts to take the Ice Storm again. I'm assuming he's just going to throw it here, make all these guys go missing, and then not have to worry about it. But honestly, this is a battle I like. Um, I don't think I would have taken the Ice Storm here. This is a battle I like. He gets two Battle Destiny, but like I said, you're canceling whichever one is the highest. He's probably going to draw two fours or whatever, or four and a five. He canceled the five. He draws. He gets a four. Four doesn't crack either ship's immunity. Uh, you draw your two destiny, clear off multiple guys. Um, Ice Storm is simplistic. You make all the guys go missing, and then none of them have to worry about shuttling back up and whatnot, um, which is also fine. Um, and then that would leave you extra force to put a second pilot, like Kane and Jarrus or something, on the profundity. And then he'd be a pilot you could then lose when you initiate the battle. So either either line has its merits. Uh, personal preference, I probably would have just taken the ship and battled in both places, causing the extra loss and retrieval, but that's just me. Wah, wah, wah. Um, this is in a tournament, this is where someone raises their hand and goes, Judge! What are the missing rules again? How do I do a search party? For those of you curious how search parties work, uh, you deploy characters or vehicles here during your control phase. 
you designate a search party and the people who are participating. You draw a destiny. You add one for each character or vehicle you have participating in the search party. Uh, two, if any of them are scouts. If your total is greater than five, you randomly find one of your missing characters at that location. Those cards may then not move or battle for the rest of the turn. Um, they can force drain. If uh, they were the only ones at the location, they would be enabled, allowed to initiate a force drain, but they may not move or battle for the remainder of turn. Phantom and Kanan Jarrus are going after the Conquest. He will not have any force available to retrieve. He will just cause the force loss. Uh, Kanan Jarrus cancels immunity to attrition. I believe that works even while he is in space. Nope. It's only one present with an Imperial or two Rebels. All immunity here is cancelled. In this case, it is not. But he's going to battle here first with Ray and the Profundity. Hang on a second. Did he not draw Battle Destiny? He did not draw Battle Destiny. So something went awry there. Maybe we're about to get a, another revert. Yep, there's a revert coming. Okay. I was like, uh, I don't know, don't know what happened there. But yeah, he uh, <laughs> he should have gotten two Battle Destiny. I guess he forgot to that Haven is a May action. Haven has to be declared. Um. Hopefully this doesn't freeze up the replay. Okay, good. Um, yeah, Haven is a may add a battle destiny, so it does have to be declared. I guess maybe they're talking about stuff, or did this freeze up the game? No, don't freeze the replay. We want to see what happens. <sighs> we got reverted. Well, that's a bummer. I kind of wanted to see how this game turned out. I have a feeling I know how it turned out. He draws two Battle Destiny here, clears the Stalker off, and then possibly battles here as well, and clears the Conquest off. And then Light Dark Side has two guys that it has to pay to drain. No ships left except a really expensive Executor in their hand that doesn't really do a whole lot by itself and a bunch of its best characters missing at the third marker. Um, which would then lead me to believe that Lightside is going to win this game. Uh, they've got 13 cards left face down. Darkside can afford to pay to drain for a couple of turns, or, you know, just throw the Executor at one of these extra systems. Uh, I'd throw it up here, where at least it can move around between a few systems, as opposed to down here, where it's got fewer places to move. It can get chased around by Lightside and their ships for a while, while Maul and Dooku just keep doing their drain one, drain one, uh, and just milling a few more cards to cut the differential. But, alright, so unfortunately we don't get to see the exact end of that game. Let's see, alright, so... Alright... Let's catch up on chat, shall we? Adam's in the chat, so uh, he did forget to add the destiny. He uh, They reverted, so he didn't draw anything there. Uh, he cleared both ships. He didn't deploy anything and drew eight cards. Ray was on the Bakta tank. Kanan was lost, so he drained for seven. I'm guessing then picked back Ray back up. Between the drain at Hoth, the drain at Coruscant, because then he also wouldn't have three battlegrounds for uh, ultimatum, or uh, resistance rather. He'd only be at these two battlegrounds because he cleared both ships. So then it's this is a drain of three, Hoth is a drain of three, and then there's one here at the uh, at the docking bay. Um, this being a match play scenario and my opponent having 
no cards in hand. Uh, if this is the Executor and I'm Ryan, I deploy the Executor. I throw it to Mushtafar and then, you know, draw three or four cards, whatever I've got left. And uh, hope you find that Chirinu or whatever other pilot you need. Um, and just keep trying to move it around a little bit and get these drains off for free. back up and take a look at whatever else was going on in chat that I missed. Artificer. Welcome, Artifice. Just trying to get back into things. Well, welcome. We're glad to have you back. And Seder, thank you for the compliment that it's a good place to uh, to watch my weekly stream show. That's very true. Invasion deck, court deck, uh, that wants to flip. Flipping court, never really a good idea. Uh, you lose a lot of the, all your benefits are on the front side of that objective. Um, and it's also not the easiest thing to get them to commit cards to your locations to capture anyway. Um, so if you're gearing a lot of stuff toward capturing and feeding people to the Rancor or uh, the Sarlacc, just like in the movies, it's uh, pretty fun and interesting. But in the gameplay scenario... It doesn't always work out the best, but certainly an interesting idea. And if it's, you know, a fun game, you're looking to play with some friends, go for it. Uh, you mentioned Jawas and Ewoks, so those are definitely uh, fun kitchen table kind of decks. And uh, good luck to those. Those sound like something you should be talking to Fungineer about. I'm sure he can set you... Uh, just private message him, ask him for his Jawa and uh, Ewok lists, and he'd be the guy who I'm sure probably has several of each that he'd be more than happy to share with you. That's F-U-N-G-I-N-E-E-R, Fungineer. All right, catching back up on the rest of the game here from Adam. You put Ray back on the Lonely Phantom, fished a card out of the use pile and got Bravo Fighter, threw Bravo Fighter to Nalhutta, so now he had three systems, uh, four, all four systems covered, basically. Uh, he shuttled Wedge up to the Profundity, so it wasn't sitting there by himself. Ryan deployed Blizzard 4 plus Emperor to the fourth marker. And he ended up losing Rogue 3. Um, he didn't have any force left in the maintenance costs. Oh, he had Blizzard 4 and Vader Enforcer there. And he didn't pull him. Vader Enforcer was outside, so he had a big power difference. Okay. Uh, he left Vader there. He drained for a bunch. He moved the Ice Storm. And uh, he ended up winning by 8. Okay, well, congrats to Adam for the win by eight. Um, unfortunately, as we do know from looking at the bracket, he did lose the second game by a little more than that. I think it was 12 was the total from reading the uh, the forum thread. And, uh, you know, two close games against a great player in Ryan Jellison, a guy who's been, uh, you know, top four of an MPC, you know, top four, uh, top eight of a number of other major tournaments. So uh, certainly a very good showing uh, against a tough opponent. And uh, thanks for providing the game links and giving us some stuff to look at. Take a quick peek over at the Jemp Lobby. Not a whole lot going on in here tonight. But uh, as always, I'll just remind everybody, if you haven't subscribed or, or haven't renewed your subscription, don't forget to do that. Um, if you scroll down a little bit on the main page here, you'll also see links to... Uh, the Players Committee's YouTube page, which is where a lot of our videos from our live events end up going. You can follow us on there to get updates about those. Um, then you've got my Twitch stream and Wise Marcellus's Twitch streams. Uh, both of us live stream some games from time to time, so you can follow us on our personal pages, uh, as well as my YouTube page, which is where all of these game review shows get eventually uploaded to. They don't go to the PC's YouTube page. They go to my personal YouTube page, because I'm selfish like that, and... Uh, 
I like to have some viewers attracted to my page for content I create. Uh, so. But, uh, all right. I think that will wrap it up for tonight's show. Um, again, if you haven't signed up for the Match Play Championship and you want to take a trip out to New Jersey and play against some of the top players in the world in a live event in a very fun and exciting format, uh, you've got five more days to sign up. Registration ends this Sunday. Uh, the brackets will be out probably a week or so after that, giving everybody about two and a half weeks to prepare. Um, Matt Sokol likely to do commentary. Tim Simon on hand to do rules. Kim Caton, our tournament director. Uh, Kim is the one who ran Worlds this year for us. Uh, certainly some great players have, are on the list here uh, to compete. Unfortunately, a number of uh, top players also will not be able to attend because of previous commitments, but uh, that just means the field's wide open this year, and there uh, you know, could be some surprise names in the Final Four. So... But uh, we'll be back next Monday, 7 p.m., same bat time, same bat channel. Uh, thank you guys, as always, for watching, uh, and take care, and have a great night.